The purpose of this video is just to show you how I approach a patient who comes to see me with a problem with their hip. The first thing that I do, of course, is to take a, a history, and in an orthopedic history relating to a hip, we get a pain profile, followed by a joint profile, and an activity profile. So the pain profile means uh, finding out about the location of the pain, if there's any radiation, uh, what radiation of the pain that is, uh, what activities make the pain uh, worse, and if there's any factors that relieve the pain. A joint profile includes clicking or catching in the hip and whether there's uh, stiffness. And the activity profile, uh, we ask questions about whether the pain limits the patient's activities. Typically they'll have difficulty with an arthritic hip, for example, doing up their shoelaces. Uh, we may ask about uh, sporting activities, that sort of thing. There are non-operative and operative treatments for hip replacement. And uh, of course the non-operative treatments should be tried first. These include things like anti-inflammatory medications, physiotherapy and activity modification. And the time to consider surgery is when these non-operative treatments have failed and when the hip problem is significantly interfering with a patient's life to a degree that it's worth uh, considering uh, surgery. And so that might be for some patients that they have trouble walking around a golf course. For other patients it might be just that they can't get from the bed to the bathroom. So the first thing I ask the patient to do is stand in front of me after removing their trousers. And from this angle you can see that there's quadriceps wasting or, or thigh muscle wasting on the left. Uh, compared to the right, and that's consistent with pathology in the hip. It would also fit with pathology in the knee. And I can also see that the left foot is, is turned out a little, and he's standing with more of, a, more of his weight on his right leg, and all of that just points to a, a problem in the left hip. So now, sir, if I could ask you to stand on your right leg, please. He's reasonably well balanced on his right leg. And stand on your left leg, please. He stands on his left, his upper body moves over the left hip, and that's called a Trendelenburg sign. Okay, just stand normally. Okay, thank you, sir. Now I'll ask you to uh, turn around and just walk towards the wall for me, please. And then turn back and walk towards us. And when he takes weight on his left leg, the upper body swings over the left hip because of uh, pain and weakness in the left hip. And with the patient facing away from me, I again look for wasting and feel the tops of the iliac crest to see if there's any gross leg length discrepancy. And from this angle you can also see if the occiput is over the sacrum, um, indicating any imbalance of the uh, thorax and the spine, which is also important in hip pathology. So in the next part of the examination, I ask the patient to lie on the examination couch. I'd normally examine the left hip from the left side of the table, but it's easier to demonstrate if I stand on the right side of the table. With a tape measure, I measure the leg lengths from the anterior superior iliac spine to the medial malleolus. And in this patient, the left leg is half a centimetre shorter than the right. And then check the pulses. He has normal pulses. Can you feel me touching you in the yes. foot? He has normal sensation in his feet. Move your toes up and down and normal motor function. The quads wasting can be palpated more easily than it can be seen and the quads wasting is quite clear to palpation here in the left thigh compared to the right. I'll just move the leg now, uh, watching the patient's face to see if I'm causing any pain. So he internally rotates to zero and this hip's quite irritable, it's, it's making him uncomfortable and it externally rotates to 50 degrees. Can you lift this leg straight up in the air? So he's able to straight leg raise but Judging from his face, it's quite uncomfortable for him. Just relax now. That's it, I've got it. Bend the knee and the hip. And this is quite uncomfortable, it's an irritable hip. He flexes only to about 90 degrees. And then to check for extension, we do Thomas's test. We bring the other hip up. Hold that right hip with your hand. Put my hand under his lumbar spine to check that the lumbar lordosis has been obliterated. And then with that leg held up, bring this leg down onto the examination table. And there was, so he's got full extension. There was a click in his hip when we extended it because of the uh, cartilage problem. And abduction, he abducts his hip to about 20 degrees and adducts 
about five degrees. I check the skin overlying the hip for any uh, scars, any signs of previous surgery. Also usually check in the groin for any masses and any scars because uh, childhood infections of the hip can be drained with a, a scar in the groin. So our patient actually has bilateral avascular necrosis. It's difficult to see on the right hip on the x-ray but on the left hip you can see uh, there's subchondral collapse and there's an area of avascular necrosis here with some creeping substitution and it's much clearer on the MRI scan. This is the MRI scan of the left hip showing avascular necrosis affecting a large area of the femoral head. And so um, he's a young man, only uh, 58 years old and um, normally in this age group we consider resurfacing but with this much bone damage in the femoral head he's a good candidate for a uh, total hip replacement so that's what we're planning to do for him.